take a look at Azure servers now. And again, I thought it'd be interesting to look down memory lane a little bit here by first taking a look at the general purpose server SKUs we've got. Starting with our Gen 2 servers, which we introduced when we launched Azure back in 2010, and comparing that to the latest generation of general purpose servers that we've got, both Intel and AMD varieties. You can see with the pictures that they look pretty much the same, but underneath the hood, technology has advanced a lot. Our Gen 2 servers were just 12 cores, 2 gigahertz processors, 32 gigabytes of RAM, 6 500 gigabyte S uh, hard disks, no SSDs, and just a 1 gigabit network. Now, if you take a look just at the Intel Gen 7, for example, it's got two sockets, 26 cores each for a total of 52 cores. It's got 576 gigabytes of RAM and it's got roughly seven terabytes of SSD with no hard disk and a 50 gigabit network adapter on top of it. Our AMD version is roughly the same. And these are the latest Cascade Lake and Rome generation CPUs. But 576 gigabytes of RAM seems like a lot. In fact, at one point it was. If you take a look at our memory optimized servers and also go down memory lane, here's uh, bar charts that I'm gonna be showing to show you relatively speaking how our memory optimized servers compared to our gen these general purpose SKUs. So height is amount of RAM, width is the number of cores. And here you can see the, our original memory optimized server SKU. We called it Godzilla internally. I've talked about it publicly before. This had two sockets with 16 cores each, 512 gigabytes of RAM. You can see that this memory optimized server that we launched back in 2015 has less RAM now than our general purpose servers, but this was considered so big we named it Godzilla. It's got nine 800 gigabyte SSDs in it and 40 gigabit network adapter in it. The reason we introduced this is that many enterprises were starting to migrate SAP HANA workloads to public Azure, and they, those need huge amounts of RAM with a certain RAM to core ratio to support that workload. But Godzilla was the first step. Customers were bringing more production, larger customers were coming with their SAP workloads, and so we needed even bigger servers. So we introduced the Beast. We called it the Beast. It had four terabytes, so eight times the amount of RAM as Godzilla. And you can see four sockets now, 18 cores per socket. So much larger in size, but even this didn't satisfy the demand for those largest enterprises moving their SAP workloads to Azure. So last year, we introduced the Beast V2. This is the MV2 series of virtual machine. This has 12 terabytes of RAM in it. It's got eight sockets with 28 cores per socket. So much, much bigger now. Largest public virtual machines in the cloud. Uh, but even this, we've got customers saying, we need bigger servers for our biggest SAP HANA workloads that we're migrating to Azure. So not too distant future, but we're gonna be introducing this server, which I'm calling, what else? Mega Godzilla Beast. This one has 16 sockets in it, 28 cores, for a total of 448 cores, 192 uh, gigabytes, uh, a total of 24 terabytes of RAM, uh, so that you can see it's uh, 192 DIMM slots of 128 gigabytes each. So 128 gigabyte DIMM by itself is a large scale server. Think about 192 of those. And so this is really kind of the, the state of the art for the largest virtual machines in the public cloud now, which we'll have online shortly. But we're also focused on other types of specialized servers, not just high memory, but also ones focused on a, a workload that's getting more and more important for enterprises and for the world in general. And that's uh, deep learning workloads that are running on deep learning optimized GPUs. The current state of the art for compute op for optimized DNN GPU is the NVIDIA A100 Tensor Core GPU. This GPU has 40 gigabytes of HBM high bandwidth memory. It's got uh, two to 20 times the performance of the previous generation, the Volta, the V100 GPUs from NVIDIA. It's got PCI Gen 4, we've got in Azure AMD servers, and this is the what underlies the NDV4 virtual machine type for deep learning workloads. That's just a single A100 GPU, but there's actually eight of those inside of every server that we deploy as part of this capacity. And if you allocate a virtual machine that takes advantage of all eight of them, the whole full server, you also take advantage of that point of NVSwitch and NVLink, uh, very high bandwidth, 
high low latency interconnect between those GPUs. In fact, it's 2.4 terabits bidirectional bandwidth connecting all of those GPUs together. So this is for even large scale training on a single box of eight of these is a ton of firepower. But we go even a step further. We talked at Build about building an AI supercomputer, the fifth largest, fifth, fifth most powerful supercomputer in the world by its ability to crunch data. And that is built on top of our clusters, which are connected with Mellanox, HDR, and Fitaband, 200 gigabit networks for a total of 1.6 terabits of interconnectivity between the servers. So this is for very large scale training and you can deploy them now. This is the same architecture, the same servers that OpenAI ran their GPT-3 and 175 billion largest parameter model ever trained uh, to achieve the, the model output, the weights that they've created that have resulted in the GP3 APIs that they're making available. So these uh, APIs are, are doing some amazing things with synthesizing natural language. But GPUs aren't just used for machine learning training. They're also used for visualization. They're also used for gaming. And you might have heard of xCloud, which is streaming video games from Azure data centers onto mobile devices. So you can play tier one titles, very compute intensive, GPU intensive titles on an Android phone device streaming directly from GPUs actually running those games in public Azure. And the way that we do that is by creating these specialized Xbox One servers, 2U servers with eight Xbox Ones in each one of those that are sitting in Azure's data centers with Azure networking and Azure services alongside them. So what that means is that the game content is served out of Azure storage directly next to those Xbox Ones. The traffic goes out through Azure data center networks into Azure front door, which I talked about earlier, and then gets delivered to customer or to your Android device where you're playing Halo, for example, on top of uh, a small low powered phone. Now, we're also not just taking a look at the individual server design, we're taking a look at the data center server architecture in general. So today, the way that we construct servers is that we put all of the components inside the same box. And then the virtual machine runs on that box and gets it direct access to those local components. What this means is that we've got to create specialized versions of each server type. If you want GPUs, you create server GPUs. The servers with GPUs. If you want FPGAs, you create servers with FPGAs. If you want servers with SCSI devices, and you get the picture. Now there's lots of combinations though, and we can't serve all combinations. Not just that, but we need to put a certain amount of components inside the same box to be efficient. But if the workloads don't need all those components, then you end up with what's called fragmentations, resources that are sitting idle. If we could create larger pools of those resources and just draw on them, as we need, take a GPU from here, take a SCUDI device from here, connect it to some CPU and memory, we could actually be much more efficient with allocation. And that's in fact what we're exploring, is disaggregated architectures. One such disaggregated architecture you can imagine would be racks, racks of servers just holding GPUs and, and uh, projecting them out, racks of servers with RAM, projecting that out as a pool of resources, and you get the idea. And then we can, mix and match these components to create different combinations of offers as needed. So you could have, for example, that light blue is a CPU plus some, a certain amount of RAM, one slot, slot of RAM plus three GPUs, and now we've got a custom server and we're not wasting any resources. This is, requires some kind of groundbreaking technology and we've started with proof of concepts. And I wanna show you one such proof of concept, which is disaggregated GPUs. With disaggregated GPUs, in this proof of concept, we're taking the GPU, putting on a separate card, sitting next to an FPGA. That FPGA is implementing a PCIe protocol on one end and an optical interconnect protocol on the other end, which is connected to another card in the server, which is, again, doing the same thing, translating the optical interconnect protocol to a PCIe protocol, and then projecting the device into a virtual machine as if it was local. And with this, we start to get to that world of disaggregation. Let's take a look at that in action. So here you can see that actual setup in the lab. There you can see the server. You can see a light blue wire coming out of, that's the optical internet connect cable connected to the PCIe card with the FPGA on it. 
And then sitting on the table, or sitting on that other server chassis, you can see another card which has the GPU on it with the optical interconnect there on the bottom right of that card. And so if we take a look at how this performs, uh, we've got a comparison of the re that GPU that you see there running on the right with the machine learning training workload that we're going to run on it. And on the left, we've got a local GPU running the same training workload. And one of the things you can see as this workload is running it, and it's running epochs of training, is that we're seeing roughly two milliseconds per epoch of training time on the local GPU. And on the remote one, we see almost exactly the same thing, about two milliseconds. We've actually done benchmarks across a bunch of machine learning models on the local GPU, on the remote GPU, and you can see from this chart, they get identical behaviors. In fact, in some cases, the, the remote one uh, comes very close um, to the, the local one. In fact, it beats it on the LSTM model for some reason. So it's within the, the noise uh, area of noise. But you can do more than that. We've also, um, just for my own benefit, installed Flight Simulator on that server with the disaggregated GPU and run Flight Simulator, which Microsoft just released uh, after a long hiatus. A uh, very cool version of it, too. You can see real-time maps and pictures here with real-time weather. And here we're flying over the Redmond area and out of the cockpit window there. You can see now in the center of the window there, uh, Highway 520, which runs right through the heart of Microsoft's campus there. So getting a chance to virtually fly over that. And the other cool thing about this is that all this weather and map data streams from Azure itself.